Good morning, John. I'm at the office. It's too early. Hey, Nick and Nicole. Hi. 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 We're doing something weird today. I'm going to show you in just a second. Hello. Hi, how are you? Good. How are you doing? Good. This is Superintendent Juno. She is running for Congress. Yep. To represent the state of Montana. Um, you're talking to my brother right now. Oh, hi. How are you? <laughs> so we do all the shooting down here. All right. Oh, yeah. That looks good. Oh, yeah. thank you. Was that kind of like too jittery? Super, super official. This Hi. is my audience. Hi, audience. And also my brother. Hi, John. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I wanted to talk to you, and I'm so grateful for you for doing this uh, because I, I don't really want to talk about policy mm -hmm. or about your campaign or what you're going to do for Montana when you're in Washington, which I imagine is most of what you talk about, which is good. Right. I just want to talk about like government, being an elected official, which you are right now, yeah. and uh, and you know, how things have gotten very partisan and how that affects you running for office mm -hmm. and you as a person also, because I think often we've, times we forget that politicians are people. <laughs> um, but before we get into any of that, I'm going to give you a pop quiz. All right. If that's okay with you. Um, I think you will know the answers to all of these ones. I hope ones. so. You are running for? U.S. House of Representatives. And, uh, and that is? A House of Congress. So members of the House of Representatives do what? They make laws. And, uh, and the final question in the pop quiz is, how do you expect to afford the rents in D.C. Well, if you win? That's going to be a tough one. Probably get roommates and have to figure out who my friends in Congress are going to be. <laughs> okay, so you got all the questions right. This is a goat. Oh, awesome. Thank you so much. Everyone gets a goat. <laughs> Everyone gets a goat. You guys don't get goats. At MSU oh, campus, they actually, the, they've been doing a lot of work registering voters, and they have a vote goat. Oh, okay. Is it a live goat? It is a live goat. <laughs> <laughs> sure. What do you get? Right. Like, if you vote, you get to, like, pet the goat? I don't know. It's just a vote goat that goes around with them to draw people over, so then you can register them to vote. And, oh. but the campus organizers have actually registered, like, 1,600 new voters in wow. a week. I, I was looking at uh, the second election that you were in, and it wasn't much more than 1,600 people. Yeah, that that's the what difference. I tell people. So my conversation with young people on the trip was, if your vote is your voice, your voice is amplified in this mm -hmm. state. Because a yep. U.S. Senate seat was won by 3,200 votes for the U.S. Senate. Mm -hmm. The balance of the U.S. Senate hung on that. My race last time was won by like 2,200 votes. And so super close races yeah. in this state. I mean, I... I voted in Florida in the year 2000, right. a big state, but still hung on very few votes. Totally. Um, now, now we are on to everyone's favorite topic, uh, which is their own self. So we're <laughs> going to talk about you. So you currently hold an elected office. You are the superintendent of public instruction, Correct. which to, is just like the head of the head, we, yeah, it's the head of all the schools in Montana, okay. basically. Every four years, people vote for this position. It's one of our statewide offices mm -hmm. per our state constitution. How did you end up running for that? Like, how did you know that that was a thing? Right. Did you have people who encouraged you to do it? Right. Was that something that was appealing? Why, why was that appealing? Yeah, to you? it was. I'm a teacher turned attorney, turned back to education. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I grew up all, with two teachers as parents. I became a teacher. I worked at the agency that I now oversee, mm -hmm. and we have term limits in this state. And so when the top person okay. was termed out, I was encouraged to run for that job. My mom had been in the state legislature, and so she, you know, watching her sort of be involved with politics, I just really became interested where policy and politics intersect mm -hmm. and saw that you can actually get some things done as an elected official and so stepped up to run for this yeah. position. Was your campaign for the statewide office, was that significantly different than what you're experiencing yes. now running for a more high profile Yes, thing? totally. You know, the issues are bigger. There's more scrutiny. You mm -hmm. know, there's all, there's a, there's a larger microscope on you, you could also get a bigger megaphone. And so that's good too. Mm -hmm. I actually enjoy traveling around the state and visiting with people about issues that matter. And so it's been fun. Okay. It has been actually. <laughs> I believe you. Um, I imagine there's also tough parts of that, like not a lot of time scheduled for sleep. Um, and also there's a lot of people who are going to be saying nasty things about sure. you. I have probably more than running for a super, superintendent sure. of, of public instruction. I'm just curious what the worst part is. It I is guess. that. I think it's the negativity in politics right now. It's the divisiveness. Good ideas sometimes don't get to be discussed because we draw ideological lines and, and talk about 
you know, fear-based sorts of issues rather than actually talking about issues that matter. And mm -hmm. so that gets frustrating in a lot of ways, but it's also, you know, the money in politics and the idea that people buy airtime and put ugly pictures of you up on the TV, right? And make sure that you don't look, uh, that you can look scary, that you can look mean, that you can look all these ways that you're really not and paint a negative picture of mm -hmm. you, those are hard. Yeah. Um, and you know, we, I would like to be able to get back to talk about the issues that actually matter to Montanans rather than having to combat that all the time. Yeah, I mean, at the same time, like you need to figure out how to get people invested in these things yeah. and how to get people to pay attention even to a, a race that for, that is extremely important, but everybody's so hyper-focused yep. on the presidential election in a year like this, right. even more so right. than usual. Convincing people with the very limited amount of brain space that they have <clears throat> that one person is better than another is very, very difficult. Yep. How do we think about getting people more actively engaged, especially young people who I feel like are less and less tied and connected mm -hmm. with the places they physically live? Mm -hmm. And I just see a lot of people just don't even think about local elections. Right. You know, I did sort of a, a young people tour recently and I visited with college age students across the state in four different uh, colleges and universities. And the issues that they are struggling with every day are very personal. And, you know, trying to engage them and talking to them about what is it that it gets mm -hmm. you engaged and how mm -hmm. do you get interested in politics and what are those issues that we can all talk about when really some of the issues are safety on campus. Mm -hmm. and. You know, those are very local to the university and the debt that they're going to leave, which, of course, then we can talk about the congressional race and um, those sorts of issues. But it is, I think, important to try to figure out what are the issues that matter to that mm -hmm. constituency and then how do we make sure that we're communicating with them about the importance of this race and how it can actually affect them. I think communicating with them is so hard. Mm -hmm. I, you know, you got a, people got a lot of things going right. on. And, and I think a lot of times that the divisiveness is just trying mm -hmm. to find something that will get people to pay attention. Yep. So it is really hard to see, especially at, with the presidential election this year, of how divisive it is, mm -hmm. the bombastic rhetoric that happens, the political posturing, and talking about issues that really don't matter that mm -hmm. much mm -hmm. when we really should be talking about... I mean, I haven't heard much at the presidential level about the economy, how they're going to move that forward. Just. No. what the bread and butter issues for no. Americans and it's so it gets really hard to fight through that and talk mm -hmm. about reasonableness and rational yeah. kinds of common sense ideas at these more statewide and local yeah. issues but that's really also where policy can matter most government in America is local mm -hmm. and what I've seen through the superintendency is School board elections, school mm -hmm. boards for public education is really where the power is. And mm -hmm. the people who get elected at the most local level from the community to step into an unpaid position, they deal with multi-million dollar budgets, they hire and fire, they determine the textbook students read, mm -hmm. they do all the business of a school and that matters so much to a community yeah. and it's so those local races really do matter so we talked a little bit about the worst part of running for office what what's the what's the best part i'm going to I, give you a, yeah i do think it one. is visiting with people across the state yeah. and knowing that you know i think one thing in montana and what i will say as my theory is that we get painted as a red state so we get painted sure. as always voting republican but we have five of the eight top statewide positions yeah. as democrats in this state mm -hmm. and we win it because we're out talking to people and I think in, in our state people still expect access to mm -hmm. their elected officials they expect access to the candidates running and when they get to know you you know they like you they like your ideas mm -hmm. and we, that's still possible here since it is a pretty red state mm -hmm. is it and also just like it's a different state right. than, than the nation mm -hmm. is uh, is it is it different to be a Montana Democrat than sort of a Democrat the way that people think about a Democratic candidate? Yeah, totally. I think that, you know, the biggest issue in our state right now, which doesn't resonate with most of the country, is public lands. Mm -hmm. And the idea that Montanans like to be outside, that's what we love about our state. We like to be hunting and fishing and hiking and biking and doing all those things that we love to do in the outdoors. That's not an issue that you would see in a lot of other states. It's very mm -hmm. Western and very Montana based and it's a very important issue this year because there's a lot of movement to transfer or sell mm -hmm. public, America's public lands to states or private individuals and mm -hmm. Montanans really want to hold on to that and so there, I think there are specific issues 
um, in politics in Western states and in, in Montana particularly that uh, that isn't present in a lot of other areas. So is it safe to say that during this campaign you kind of came out? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is actually a historic election in a lot of different ways. <laughs> yeah, totally. You know, Montana actually have been trailblazers in their boats. They elected the first woman to Congress and Jeanette Rankin before women even had the right to vote 100 years ago. Mm -hmm. We haven't elected a woman since Jeanette Rankin. <laughs> and so, you know, a century later, it's mm -hmm. time. Um, but also, I am an enrolled member of the Mandan Hidatsa tribes of North Dakota. I grew up on the Blackfeet Reservation here in Montana. Um, and there's never been an American Indian woman to serve in Congress ever. Yeah. And so that's historic as well. And, you know, also when I started this race, I introduced my partner at one of the uh, Democratic uh, events that we have across the state. And mm -hmm. so it came out in a way, I guess. But yeah, I mean, they hadn't yeah. necessarily been secretive about it, but hadn't no, talked about it publicly. Right, hadn't yeah. talked about it publicly. So I introduced my partner, you know, because you do really need, if you have somebody in your life and they, they need to be there to support you because this mm -hmm. is really hard to do. And <laughs> yeah. so it's nice to have her there. And But the idea that it's historic and that we've also not ever had an openly gay candidate run for federal office in the state. And yeah. so it's historic in a lot of ways. But I always tell people, it's like, through my work as superintendent, I do have a good record to stand on. You know, we've raised graduation rates to historic highs in the state. I have a good record on the land board of expanding access to public lands in the state. So you get a qualified person, you get a competent person, mm -hmm. and as a bonus, you get all these firsts as well. <laughs> Did you feel like that was something that you needed to do for political reasons as well as personal ones? Uh, yeah, I think it was a mixture of both. I think, like I said earlier, you know, that people expect access. They want to know who their candidates are. Mm -hmm. And I think stepping up to this level from superintendent to Congress, it was important to mm -hmm. make sure things were out there because of the negativity that can sometimes happen. You didn't want it to have a whisper campaign. You didn't want it to become an issue. So, mm -hmm. and it really hasn't been it become an issue, which yeah, is it's great. great. <laughs> I think, particularly when we look at Montana and we, you know, the stereotypes around our state um, and its people, it actually hasn't become a political issue, yeah. which I think speaks volumes for our state and our country in the direction mm -hmm. we're moving. Were you worried about there being Well, bad? I wasn't sure how yeah. it would be handled, you know, or what it was going to be. There was, you know, it was like breaking news right after yeah. that. And mm -hmm. maybe because it was unique in a way and it hadn't happened before and it was historic uh, yeah. for our state, there was some interest from the press and there continues to be, mm -hmm. you know, whenever it get, comes up, it came up in a debate. And so mm. it became of interest again. Um, whether it's headline worthy anymore, I'm not sure. Um, mm. But I think, uh, you know, I've been really proud of the fact that Montana has sort of just moved on and they're looking at the issues, they're looking at the qualifications of a mm -hmm. person. It's still around a little bit, yeah. but um, it's not become such a big issue. And I think that's good. So I've lived in Montana for 13 years mm -hmm. now. Uh, and I think that's a pretty long time, but it's not a long time by like Montana standards. I feel like in order to run for office in Montana, you have to be here at, at, like, at least born here, but right. at best if it's if your grandparents were born here. I was on your Twitter yesterday. Right. It says in your bio, uh, 54th generation Montana, which made me laugh because everyone's always bragging their That's political That's what they're supposed to do. Yeah. Make you laugh. About how, how long they've been in Montana. Right. How, I just want to know how did you come to that particular number? I just figure it's a long time <laughs> and, um, you know, it can try to disprove it, <laughs> but it's sort of like, um, American Indian people have been in, here before mm -hmm. America was a country. Yeah. And so, you know, it does go back so far and, you know, the generations and it was sort of like, you know, people claim third, fourth, fifth generation. Yeah. And so it was sort of a play on that. <laughs> and it just, I think, points out that, I do have a long history here. I come from a place uh, both with the Mandan Hidatsa in North Dakota and on the Blackfeet Reservation that we're here and it's important to bring that aspect of mm -hmm. history to this race as well. In the West, Native American populations are often some of the poorest communities. Mm -hmm. And I know that the reasons for that are like mm -hmm. very long and historical and, and, <clears throat> and very difficult to, to you know, parse and, and work through. Um, what can, you know, politicians, elected officials do to increase the equality between native populations and right. the rest of the state? Yeah, I mean, that's the thing is that 
we can look at this state in particular, really across the country. And there are tribes now that are making a move. And, and you know, when they are the casino tribes mm -hmm. that have really been able to increase their economic uh, foundation. Mm -hmm. And then you have tribes like in Montana that still really struggle. And it is a lot of history. And that's, I think, the importance of members of Congress as well, because there's such a direct relationship in our mm -hmm. country between the federal government and tribes. I mean, they are interconnected, yeah. really. And every law that Congress makes has an effect in Indian country. And, and sometimes because those laws are sort of one size fits all for these 500 some nations across the country, mm -hmm. it makes it really difficult. And so, um, you know, the idea that these are sort of nations within our nation and they have their own tribal government sovereignty, sovereignty and they have are able to create their own economic self-determination. Those are issues that are really important to me. Mm -hmm. And I think that we really need to let tribal governments drive that. And a lot of times federal policy and federal rules get in the way mm -hmm. of, of them being able to move and progress forward. And you know, the fact that this is a legal relationship because of treaties which are present you know, in our US Constitution it's important to make sure that we're living up to those obligations. It's never happened as a country. And the three things I think that are present in most treaties are health, safety, and education. And if we support tribes and live up to our obligations through those mm -hmm. treaty rights, I think we'd be in a better place. You know, these are areas of high poverty, generational poverty, concentrated poverty, and isolated poverty. And, mm -hmm. and that makes it really difficult to figure out ways and a pathway forward for a lot of economic um, vibrancy. Yeah. Yeah, I think that usually when there are problems like this, it's because they're hard problems. Yep, yeah, they're difficult and it will take a full court press from coming yeah. from all different. And I was, you know, hopeful earlier on, um, you know, this administration actually had great ideas mm -hmm. uh, about pulling together all the agencies that affect Indian country, so education, labor, Department of Public Health and Human Services, mm -hmm. to try to really figure out how housing, how mm -hmm. all those issues work together to, but the, even at that level, it, it's hard to get together and mm -hmm. figure out a pathway forward. But I do think tribes need to always be at the table yeah. in determining those, they've often been absent. And that's the, great hope I think of this election is that we can actually elect an American Indian woman to Congress that has not been present. That unique perspective mm -hmm. has never been there. Mm -hmm. And the idea that it can be there and you're one of 435, but you can be a loud voice and mm -hmm. you can make sure that you're advocating for the right issues and not just Indian country, but also for rural America and Montana. So I want to talk about your job right now. Mm -hmm. You are an elected official. You help to run and improve the schools in Montana. Yeah. What, like, what is that job? What do you do day to day? We support schools. So we distribute the funding to schools. We make sure that the school food programs are going. We work to help implement academic standards. Um, we do Indian education for all. We are involved with career technical education. And so anything a school would do, mm -hmm. we sort of have a counterpart at the state level. Okay. So we deal a lot with federal law implementation, making sure schools are doing that, and also state laws that get implemented. And so we're basically, I mean, we monitor, we make sure that they're following the rules, but we also support them in a lot of different efforts to make sure that mm -hmm. they have professional development for teachers. But my role as a superintendent is, you know, I get to get out and go see schools and see what's mm -hmm. happening and talk with teachers. And one of the best things that I've actually done as superintendent is create a student advisory board. And so for the last six years, I've actually pulled together 35 to 40 students from all across the state. And they meet twice. And we, these are students who are from small schools or in big schools. They may have been valedictorian of their class. Mm -hmm. They may have dropped out of school and dropped back in. But each of them bring a really unique perspective. And we have really real conversations about bullying in schools, relevancy of their, what they're learning, mm -hmm. um, diversity, gay rights, you know, all those types of things that are really happening in schools so that I can make better decisions as a... Uh, elected official and that's been really good. I leave inspired every time mm -hmm. that they are smart, they're creative, they're ready to lead and we just need to as elected officials and adults in the system listen yeah. 
yeah. and make sure that we're doing the right thing as, as we move forward. But it's been really awesome. So it sounds to me like you really believe in government. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people these days, especially if you're not exposed to mm -hmm. it, if you don't connect with it, if you don't have an opportunity to, to interface with it directly, mm -hmm. just don't. I don't want to demean those people mm -hmm. because like, maybe their voice isn't being heard. But I think that there's so much great governance that yep. gets done in this country. Yeah, and I mean, I've watched it happen as an elected official of just empowering people. I think that is a good role. I mean, mm -hmm. being able to use your elected position as a bully pulpit of sorts, of being able to get out and put focus on issues that matter. When I stepped into office, too many students were dropping out of school. We had mm -hmm. over 2,000 students in this state that were dropping out of school, and that's a big number for Montana. Yeah. And I knew we could do better. And so really just started talking about what was happening, why was it happening. That's why the Student Advisory Board was mm -hmm. important to like give me a voice from the ground up. Mm -hmm. And then just started pulling people together in communities across the state. And the real strength is that that was a grassroots movement. We just sort of helped and supported. We created these public-private partnerships at the state level. We're able to seed fund some of those efforts, and that's now in 58 communities in the state. Their work has resulted in historically high graduation mm -hmm. rates two years in a row. You know, we don't ask whether you're a Republican or a Democrat or what yeah. your paycheck is. It's like, just come to the table and let's mm -hmm. support kids get through school. If you aren't that tuned in, mostly what you hear about government is the most dysfunctional things. Right. In America, we have very strong <clears throat> local government, and mm -hmm. it's it's kind of unusual in that, like most places have really strong federal governments mm -hmm. and the local is kind of dysfunctional. And I'm, I'm worried about the future in which young people aren't as interested in that. Yeah. Because they see government as dysfunctional or because they just see it as like an unpleasant task right. to try and get into that. Mm -hmm. I, I want my audience to be interested in running for yep. public office. I want them to see that as an option that mm -hmm. I don't think a lot of them do. Right, and it is because I think our country and our rhetoric right now around politics is so divisive and we all focus on the bad things and we focus on the dysfunction and that's what we see. We see it through our media, we see it on social media. We really need to talk about democracy and the basis of our country and why we are so awesome, right? <laughs> we can get back to the idea of good government and that we can, government can support people, it can make a pathway to prosperity and people should participate in that. Mm -hmm. At the very least, they should be voting to have a voice. And if, I mean, the fact that people feel disenfranchised from that, I think is a problem. You know, the next step after that is like, see yourself in an elected position, you know, from city council, school board, mm -hmm. something local that really does affect your community or Congress, and mm -hmm. that those things are possible. And I think that really, you know, we talked earlier about the historic nature of this race. This is, a race and a campaign about bringing disenfranchised groups into places of power. Mm -hmm. And we need more of that. We need more American Indian people running. We need more gay people running. We need more of those groups that have felt disempowered, but that doesn't happen unless people step up. Representation matters. And um, we do have a system where people can feel empowered to run for office. Mm -hmm. And I think that's pretty cool. We need to start electing people who are willing to compromise, mm -hmm. willing to collaborate, and willing to do the right thing of listening to people and bringing their, taking their issues to their place of power. What do you think politicians can do to make it feel, like to put the government, mm -hmm. like uh, the running of our country ahead of winning the election? Be present. 90% of politics is showing up and you show up where people are gathered and yeah. you listen and you know you put aside your partisan hat and you actually listen to people about mm -hmm. what are your issues why are they challenging and how can we make them better mm -hmm. and then you i mean that's really the function of government is to make things better and and that's why elections matter it really does matter who sits in those seats that can actually get down and do the business of good government would you say that Congressman Zinke, who's your opponent in this race, like has the same basic opinion about that though? I would say he would say that, but <laughs> I, would, I also think we look at the actions of people and you know, he is, seems to me to be more interested in getting on the 24 hour news cycle. He's mm -hmm. always been more interested on what's next for himself and not really what's best for 
the mm -hmm. people who elected him. You know, when I saw that happening and being an elected official myself, I know we can do good things. I've done it as superintendent, and I don't see that in our current congressman. I have a friend who is in the city council mm -hmm. in Missoula, and even that position, he gets really, really mean mm -hmm. people <laughs> like right. speaking to him face to like it just seems very unpleasant right for every message you get and every letter you get that says I hate you and you're doing the wrong thing and you're horrible you get three or four that are really good that you've supported their efforts and so you know you get the good thank you notes too or you run into people where who say you know my student my kid would not have graduated were it not for graduation matters Montana or the fact that my kid was on your student advisory board Mm -hmm. where she found her voice for the first time. You know, those are the things I think, being an elected official, creating those types of policies, bringing those types of groups together that make it worthwhile. And yep, you're gonna always get the haters, but um, you know, the good stuff always outweighs those. I believe you, I guess. Yeah, you should. <laughs> It's funny because like you hear about YouTube comments mm -hmm. and how awful they can be. And, uh, and what my friend on the city council deals with is significantly right. worse than a YouTube comment. Right. And I'm just like, I don't know what to do. Well, it's like if it's a YouTube comment, it's just some person right, somewhere just, in the world. Right. But if it's somebody who lives in your town, right. your neighbor, right. who's saying these awful things about you. That you're gonna run into you. at the store sometime. Yeah. Hopefully, eventually we get to a place of civility again. And, you know, but those are also people who you are representing and they do have a voice, they're using it. Um, you know, probably not the way that you would like them to, you know, because mm -hmm. you like to be complimented instead of <laughs> not. They are exercising what, as a citizen who mm -hmm. you are representing, mm -hmm. they're exercising their right to complain, I guess, as long as they voted. Right, if you want to complain, <laughs> right. Um, I hope you've registered because it might be too late now. Amazingly enough, burned through almost all of my questions. All right. So I'm just gonna ask, uh, maybe I can give you a break mm -hmm. to not be doing something for a moment or two, sure. which I imagine doesn't happen very much. So I'm gonna ask two more questions. Okay. Uh, one is, how terrifying is a debate? Because oh, it seems scary. so scary. It is, I mean, it is something where, you know, we did a lot of debate prep, and so you go through a lot of issues, you figure out how, I mean, you kind of have to guess on what you're going to get asked. It's mm -hmm. always a curveball, you never know. It is a good chance for voters to hear from the candidates. It's the mm -hmm. idea that people expect access, and they should expect access to their elected officials and their candidates, and this is really an opportunity for them to hear about where they stand. But it is scary because you don't know what exactly is going to get asked. You want to mm -hmm. make sure that you appear competent and qualified. <laughs> and so, you know, running through those things and debate prep is so important to make sure that you're doing that. Yeah. And, um, but getting up on that stage, it's something. I mean, you I are imagine. definitely awake. <laughs> <laughs> Last debate actually had an audience question, which we mm -hmm. often don't get, which was interesting. And it was about how are you go if you're elected, how will you help LGBTQ people mm -hmm. in the country. That sort of was a new question we hadn't been asked in previous mm -hmm. debates. And so my answer was, number one, get elected. <laughs> That's not fair. <laughs> it's very fair. So I, I guess my, my last question is just how do, you, uh, how do you help Americans believe in government? Well, I think, number one, get elected. And <laughs> when you're an elected official, you have to work with your constituency. You have to work with the citizens that elected you, you have to make sure that you are listening to them and that you can actually get some good things done. And I know that it's possible and that happens because of elections. That happens because people show up to vote and sometimes it's slim margins, mm -hmm. but it makes a difference. Representation matters. Who's sitting in those seats of power really does affect your everyday life. And I think that's sometimes where we stray is that for, for a lot of the populace, things are okay. And so it's mm -hmm. hard until things become broken that people don't get to pay attention a lot. And so my advice is pay attention now. Know how government affects your life. Know what kind of policies are out there. And then elect the person who's going to help you better improve and improve your community. It really helps, I think, to have conversations that are broadcasted, that are not just about like the thing that went wrong, right. or the things that we don't like, or the argument that mm -hmm. you're having. It can be hard to justify those conversations. Right. And I, like, I imagine that there are gonna be people who have comments on this video being like, why 100% why softballs, right. Hank? And I'm like, well, because this isn't necessarily right. about getting Montanans out to vote for you. It's mm -hmm. more about 
like helping people understand that politicians mm -hmm. are people and that for the most part, even like on both sides of the aisle, people have done this because they legitimately want to help. Totally. I mean, I think that really, I mean, I'm not naive about, you know, there's a lot that needs to be fixed in government. Mm -hmm. And we need to really start moving away from such divisive politics. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, through my life and through my role as an elected official, I know good things can happen. And so I do, I'm optimistic. And I think most people who run for office, you're right. They want to make sure that things get better for the people that they mm -hmm. represent. You're stepping up, you're putting yourself on the line, you're opening yourself up for scrutiny but you're also opening yourself up to have real conversations with people and when you're elected to make a difference and make a positive difference for the people who elected you. And I think that's really powerful. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks. This was fun. Um, John, I'll see you on Tuesday. Just how I end my videos. <laughs>